Jenna Engel loves the oboe. She has built her business on providing high-quality, handmade reeds, education, and a sympathetic ear to oboists across the country. When you order from Jenna Engel Reeds, you get prompt communication, reeds or cane handcrafted to your specifications, and cheerful, friendly customer service. All orders are mailed within one week, sometimes much faster. Single orders or monthly read subscriptions are welcome, and she'll work with you to find the combination of response, resistance, stability, and flexibility that is right for you. Jenna doesn't just do reads either. Look at jennaingle.com for a selection of read cases, swabs, and tools, or for read making videos, classes, and boot camps. Podcast listeners can use the code DISH for 10% off their first order. That's DISH, all caps, at jennaingle.com. Ugly Duckling Oboes is dedicated to the development of young oboe players. They provide quality handmade oboe reads, private lessons, and high-quality oboe sales, rentals, and consignments. The oboes that they rent are conservatory mechanism oboes that include the left-hand F key and low B-flat key. All are maintained by oboe-specific technicians. In-person lessons are available as well as virtual lessons for students who live outside the geographic area or have transportation or schedule challenges. They also offer online college audition coaching for high school juniors and seniors who plan to audition to be music majors. Visit UglyDucklingOboes.com for more details on how you can set yourself up for success and sign up for their newsletter. Thank you for your support, Ugly Duckling Oboes. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish. A podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. We have a dish topic for you today, and I would just I personally <laughs> like to thank all of you for hanging in there over the past, I don't know how long, while we winged it. <laughs> it feels like a long time since we've actually had a topic that we planned ahead of time. <laughs> Oops. We're doing our best. Listen. <laughs> so what are we talking about today, Galit? We're talking about wardrobe mishaps, wardrobe wins. You know, we just double read fashion. This was a request from a listener for us to dish on. And uh, I don't know why this person wants our fashion advice. I'm going to take it as a compliment. We were just saying before we started recording how grateful we are that the podcast is an audio medium. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, if you want advice on like the comfiest pajamas, I'm definitely an expert in that fashion I don't know (laughs) I mean day to day uh I'm kind of like how does one look like a professional at work I don't know shop at loft okay that's how I'll (laughs) handle that (laughs) but listen we're all trying to this is not sponsored but we're all trying to make our dollar go a little farther Uh you love thread up right Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love thrift shopping. It's my favorite non-musical activity, Mm -hmm. but there's very little thrift shopping in Hattiesburg. Mm -hmm. So I do my thrifting online. That's cool. And you found great like workwear, performance wear, all that fun stuff. Oh, yeah. You can find stuff online. Like, you know, I use ThreadUp, but there's a bunch of sites. I mean, you can find brand new things with tags on them. Mm. And you can um, like filter by your sizes and by brands. So for example, if you're only interested in brand new loft wear. Because <laughs> you want to be a professional. <laughs> <laughs> you can filter for that. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And it's way less expensive than shopping for regular clothes, brand new. And it's better for the environment because those clothes aren't going into the landfill. That's Awesome. Yes. I'm going to have to check that out. What about recitals and um, performances, concertos and stuff? Like I remember once uh, Melissa Bosma, friend of the podcast, said that she likes to think of getting dressed for a recital like Superman putting on his cape Mm. 
and that the wardrobe really makes the oboist in her case. Uh, mm. So do you have any like things you love for recitals and that type of thing? Yeah, I am a heavy sweater when it comes to recitals. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Breaking news. <laughs> this is what so. you came here for. <laughs> If you're not full body sweating by the end of a recital, you're not doing it right. Right, Jackie? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> so for me, it's all about finding a material and a pattern that I'm not going to be self-conscious about. Mm -hmm. Like I cannot wear a solid non-black mm. outfit because I'm going to feel so self-conscious the whole time. Mm hmm. So I have to have a nice pattern. I have to have like a good material that's not going to show all of the <laughs> flaws. <laughs> Just for my own personal comfort. I know we all sweat when we perform, but I start obsessing over it and uh -huh. feeling really self-conscious. So that's really important for me. And I have this one necklace that I love. It's so fancy and so pretty, but it's long and dangly and I cannot wear it when I'm holding an oboe because it continually gets caught in my keys. Oh, so annoying. Similarly, all the bassoonists will know, well, all the bassoonists who wear dresses would know, um, there's only certain things that work to play the bassoon because it comes down mm -hmm. on the side. Mm -hmm. And so I desire to wear like awesome gowns for recitals and mm -hmm. concertos and stuff but if the skirt has even the littlest bit of poof or it doesn't even have to be significant poof just kind of like excess fabric mm -hmm. it gets caught in the keys caught in your fingers it mm -hmm. just does not work there i've seen people have things that kind of like take the bassoon away from the body like squish the material i've always been on the hunt for those so if you have if you know where those come from i've only seen people with them i don't know exactly mm. how that all works but i got a balance hanger that changed the angle a little bit but i'm still nervous to wear elaborate skirts but i still love being formal and so for my upcoming concerto engagement, I'm trying something new. I don't know if it'll work. They're, they're hence coming. I've got to still try them on and see how they feel and everything. But I'm trying to channel my inner Nancy Belmont and Eleni Katz and go the jumpsuit route. Oh! So I've found a couple of options. For me, I want to be able to wear a normal bra mm -hmm. when I play. And I personally like pants. And I have a couple like fancy glittery shirts that like I'll wear to dress up an outfit. But I was like, I want to feel like I'm, you know, putting on something formal. Mm -hmm. And not I don't want to sacrifice outfit. anything else. Yeah, I yeah. want to be able to. So I'm a completely different body type from both of them and about a foot shorter than both. <laughs> so <laughs> we will see if I can pull it off in the way that they can. But uh, shout out, y'all inspired me. We're going to see how this jumpsuit situation plays out. I've got That's two so on awesome. the way. We'll try to figure out. I did order the capri because I was like, everything's going to be way too long for me. <laughs> and so I ordered capri cut jumpsuit. Jackie is the tiniest little peanut. <laughs> And so I was like, a capri cut on a tall person is going to be like normal for me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> if they are hilarious, will you send me a photo? Yes. When I get okay. them, I'll, I'll do a little fashion show for you. <laughs> get your opinion. But they are definitely solid color and they are not black. So now I'm worried about the sweat situation because I'm you, telling you, you put the baggage in me. I'm telling you. But the bassoon and the harness cover up a lot. And mm -hmm. so there's forgiveness in just how that breaks up the body. Mm -hmm. I'm just so self-conscious self about the sweating. I bought this beautiful black vintage thrifted dress mm -hmm. that I cannot wait to wear for a recital. And it has a drop shoulder. Both shoulders are drop shoulders. So it's nice and roomy under the arms. I cannot wait to wear it. Oh. I need it. I can't have it tight under there. I get mm -hmm. scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God bless the people who play strapless. 
Oh God. I can't imagine a bigger distraction. The, just the, the addition of the, like you're nervous enough. You're standing yes. up there in yes. front. I can't. <laughs> no, we're, we're on the same page on this one. So we asked y'all, our wonderful listeners for your experiences, thoughts, perspectives on this important double read subject, <laughs> what we wear while we play. And we got some beautiful answers <laughs> and some people, quite frankly, working out their past traumas on <laughs> our Instagram page. And we're here for it. We got to talk about Noel. I was just going to ask if we could start with Noel. Do it. Do it. Okay. Noel says, while walking to the front of the stage to begin my senior recital, I walked right out of my fancy new shoes. Had to walk back a few steps barefoot, slide them back on in front of everyone, <laughs> oboe in hand the whole time. But then I wasn't nervous to play. I'd already fully embarrassed myself. I just love this visual. <laughs> walking. And this it's like shoes in reverse walk. beep. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I gotta. Although I do every once in a while get requests from students, can I play barefoot? My answer is always no. Like, I have to wear shoes to walk into this building. You keep your shoes on while you are performing. I had a colleague who always wore floor length dresses and played barefoot and thought I no can't. one knew. And I can't. We, we knew. Uh, <laughs> That's adorable. Noelle said, this is going to be a story for posterity. <laughs> Rachel Becker at Boise State, friend of the podcast. Hi, Rachel. I'm glad my, uh-oh, it's Navy <laughs> moment happened in high school so I can always check colors and bright lighting. Uh, many people also lamenting they have worn Navy by mistake. <laughs> and this is not a double read, but... I had a colleague who was, you know, how in the pandemic we were having to make all those like videos of mm -hmm. uh, collaborative concerts through individually taped videos. And one of their students tried to slip a Navy shirt by and they were like, this is Navy. <laughs> and the student was like, no, it's not. <laughs> it was actually more like a royal blue, to be honest. I remember watching it and be like, why is that kid in blue? <laughs> That is my favorite kind of lie when they're like, this isn't, this isn't blue. I have 100% <laughs> done that lie though. When you're just like, okay, I'm caught, but can you not make me deal with this right now? No, I'm not willing to acknowledge this reality. I'm going to keep living in this alternate reality where my shirt is black. <laughs> and you're just like, okay. Well, you know, sometimes the black fades. Yes. And some navies are very deep. Mm-hmm. So it's understandable sometimes. I also played in an orchestra once where audience members complained that the um, blacks were too pilly. I have played in orchestras where audiences have complained that the blacks were too faded. High maintenance audience members. <laughs> like, do you realize how much this is per service? This is yeah. not enough for a new shirt. Not enough to Sir. hair. Okay. Anne Lemke, friend of the podcast. Uh, has anyone else got their skirt caught under the low B flat of their English horn? <laughs> this is a popular one too. Yes. Yeah. Caitlin Kramer says, oh my God, yes. I just said to myself, well, dot, 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 pants only now. Or Caitlin, jumpsuit. Fashion. Hey oboists, have you ever found it difficult to sort out when and how to find a new oboe or English horn? Oboe Chicago streamlines the process, providing personal and professional consultation and a large selection of lovely instruments. The process feels comfortable and thorough. Selection includes F. Loray of Paris, Howarth of London, Covey Oboes, and Fox products. For a current listing of Obo Chicago's selection, please visit www.oboechicago.com. For a credit of $100 toward shipping, mention Double Read Dish when you call or email Shauna. 
Chemical City Double Reeds is a full-service double reed shop specializing in the sale of instruments, cane, accessories, and sheet music. Double Reed Dish listeners can enjoy free shipping with code DRDISH, all caps, no spaces. Visit them in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or online at chemicalcityreads.com. We are delighted to welcome to Double Read Dish, Ryan Roberts, who plays English horn and oboe in the New York Philharmonic. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. We love to get to know our guests by starting off with how they began to play their instrument in the first place. So how did you come to the oboe? So I'll probably have to back up a little bit farther <laughs> in order to explain that. Um, I started on piano when I was five years old. Um, and... I fell in love with it immediately. I started taking it very seriously uh, pretty early on, and it became the most important thing in my life and was sort of my initial introduction into music. Um, and it, it was at a time in my life where, you know, I was in middle school, elementary school even, and all my friends would be kind of having fun and going on field trips and, you know, play dates and this and that, and I would be inside practicing piano. So it, it did become, you know, sort of a very serious thing. Um, and then I had the opportunity, or actually I was required to join band or orchestra in my elementary school public music program. Um, and so I chose the clarinet and loved it so much. And I, I sort of felt like this was my outlet for combining music and fun, which which didn't necessarily combine all the time uh, with piano. And I, sometime in middle school, transitioned from clarinet to oboe. I think probably because we just needed more oboes in our in our school band. And yeah, I mean, it really was playing in ensembles and specifically in orchestra that that drew me to the oboe and led to the oboe taking over <laughs> from the piano um, and, and kind of becoming the, uh, the most important thing in my life and, and the rest is history. It sounds like you never had a question of whether or not you were gonna be a professional musician. Is that true? Yeah, and it's been something that I have felt occasionally self-conscious about in my life just because, you know, it was, it was I realized that it was really rare to know something that huge about yourself at such a young age. Um, I mean, I have friends now who still have have no idea what, you know, what their career is going to look like and what what they really want to do. Um, but for me, I really did always know. I didn't know specifically whether it was going to be oboe, whether it was going to be piano. I don't think it was ever going to be clarinet. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but between the two. Um, yeah, I, I did always know that I would have a life in music. So how did that, because you were so serious about piano and then you started the oboe, um, how did you come to decide to actually pursue the oboe like college? And can you talk us through your like training education journey? <clears throat> yeah, so it was um, it was a difficult decision to kind of move away from piano, especially because this happened maybe like in my first few years of high school when it was either I get really serious, really, really serious about piano or really, really serious about oboe. Um, and ultimately what, you know, what led to the decision was having the opportunity to play in local youth orchestras and chamber groups. I did a lot of stuff at um, the Colburn School in their weekend programs. And I was in the American Youth Symphony and the YMF debut orchestra, and these are all just ensembles that allowed me to play with the most amazing musicians. Um, and that ignited something in me that I knew I couldn't really ignore. And I didn't really ever have feelings that strong towards um, towards piano at the time. And, and yeah, so I, I told my piano teacher basically, you know, I... I'm going to take oboe seriously. And she said, okay, if you're going to sideline piano, you're going to study with the absolute best oboe professor. And I know who he is. And uh, it was David Weiss, who is the former principal oboe of the LA Phil. And he taught at Music Academy of the West. And his wife, Alpha, is a pianist who actually studied with my piano teacher. So she's like, if you're quitting piano, or, you know, 
sidelining piano, you are going to study with David, <laughs> and you're going to do this right. Um, so uh, I started studying with David Weiss, and I just sort of took it from there. I started taking oboe really seriously. I did a little bit of reed making. I was applying to like every single opportunity I pro possibly could, whether it was a competition or a summer festival or a, you know, any sort of program, extracurricular program. Um, and I auditioned for a bunch of music schools and conservatories in my last few years of high school and um, ultimately ended up going to Juilliard, which was kind of exactly where I wanted to go for many reasons. I wanted to study with Elaine and also I really wanted to move to New York. That had always been a dream of mine, so it all kind of came together um, in, a, in a really nice way. I was, felt very lucky that everything kind of, uh, the path was illuminated for me and, and things went smoothly. You said that you became very, very serious about the oboe. What did that manifest as? Like what kind of, besides, you know, the time commitment of, you know, ensembles and <clears throat> lessons and things like that, what kind of daily commitment did that look like for you? So I suppose this is probably the time when I should tell the story about Mozart's closet, <laughs> which um, is the term for the, our laundry room in our house because <laughs> because when I was in high school you know I was taking lots of academic classes and my schedule was busy I was in marching band and marching band started at 7 15 a.m. Um, and I also was in concert band and in orchestra and you know I was, I was doing a lot of stuff and I was in AP courses and my brain was just kind of oh in God. overload and there was no time for anything but I knew that if I wanted to make make it happen with oboe and, and get into the schools that I wanted to get into that I was going to have to find a time. So I would wake up at 540 in the morning and the only soundproof room in our house was the laundry room because it has this big heavy sliding door. And so I would practice every morning for probably an hour or so um, before I left for marching band at 715 <laughs> um, oh. in this little laundry room closet. Now, I will preface that by saying I don't know how I managed to do this on a regular basis because now waking up for like this 10 a.m. interview was a struggle for me. <laughs> so this motivation. Has oh, the been... energy of youth. <laughs> yes. Exactly. That level of motivation has since uh, been lost. But but when I was you know yeah when I was younger and, and had more uh, more in me that was how I made it happen and, and that's kind of what it meant. I mean it was just making those little sacrifices and and kind of taking the extra steps whenever necessary to make sure that I got everything done <laughs> in time. Um, kind of along those lines, you are able to achieve, you know, this huge success relatively early, you know, uh, and, and young. And so did that um, kind of mentality and approach to practice carry itself through as you were embarking on your professional career and starting to take auditions? Did the intensity turn up? Can you talk to us about embarking on your professional path? Yeah, of course. So I, I would say some things stayed the same. The things that stayed the same were definitely I, uh, I always felt very focused in what I wanted to accomplish and what I wanted to achieve. Um, and I felt like I always had a very clear uh, set of goals in mind. And, and honestly, those goals were winning an orchestral job because I just knew that I loved playing an orchestra so much. Um, what changed is sort of what I was saying before, which is the the level and consistency of motivation. I, I don't think that if I had woken up every day at 5.40 a.m. And, and practiced, you know, before classes and all that throughout my Juilliard schooling, I don't think I would still be standing right now. I mean, it's, it's it was just too exhausting. Um, but that being said, I, I realized, especially when I was in school, that there are times, there are periods in your life when you need that level of insanity and sort of you need to really go the extra mile and then there are other times when you don't. Um, and that's kind of how I, how I view my um, practice schedule and, and how I try to keep my life balanced. 
Um, I'm not someone who wakes up every day and says, okay, from eight to 10, I'm gonna practice. From 10 to 11, I'm gonna make reads. Then from 11 to 12, I'm gonna you know, go on a run and then I'm gonna go to you know, make lunch and this and that and blah, blah, blah. I'm really not like that at all. I mean, there are some days where I'll practice 15, 20 minutes and then decide not really inspired and go do something else. Um, but you know, if I have an audition coming up and I know that I need to be putting in four or five hours in a day, then I do it. So um, yeah, the goals have remained really clear for me, but the way that I go about them has changed a little bit. Uh, and I think that's kind of how I approached things in school and also auditions as well. It's the marathon versus the sprint. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear about your New York Philharmonic audition. Of course. <laughs> yeah, it was... Um, it was a really, really exciting time and a stressful time for various reasons. I mean, I remember the previous auditions that they had had, um, the one before mine, I was at Juilliard and I think I was a freshman. And I remember everybody in the school uh, getting ready for this audition and they were all in the read room and they were trying their reads and, you know, the audition was across the street. And so they were, it was, it was, there was just this amazing kind of buzz and atmosphere. Um, and I didn't take it that time. I figured I was too young. And when it came around the second time, it was actually scheduled in kind of a bad spot. There was, I think, two important oboe auditions that happened the week before. Ooh. And maybe one after. Um, and this was when I was working with the New World Symphony. So I had commitments there. And it was kind of just sandwiched in between a lot of oboe stuff. Um <clears throat> And in a way, I think that may have actually helped a little bit because my mind was so focused on other stuff that when this English horn list came along, I kind of looked at it and I thought, well, I know all these pieces really well and I love all these solos and, you know, I just have to make a really good read in like three days and then, <laughs> and then see what happens. Um, because I just had a case full of oboe reads and, you know, I was living in Florida, so going from Miami to New York is kind of a, a shift for reads. But um, anyway, yeah, so the thing that was unique about this audition was that the first round was, the first live round was on, you know, whatever, a Monday or something. And then the next round, the semifinals, were a week later. So I, I advanced from the first round and then I went back to Miami. And after, you know, during that week, I was like, okay, now it's on. Now we're, we're really in it. And that was when... I kind of pushed everything else aside and thought this is an opportunity that I can't um, can't pass up or can't neglect in any way. Um, and I spent that week doing mock auditions, and I played for a lot of um, a lot of friends, and I also did things that made me happy outside of music because I tried I tried not to let this one goal kind of consume me. Um, so I exercise and I went on a lot of walks and I hung out with people and um, and then I went back for the semi-final round and then there was an oboe round um, and then the finals were at, with piano actually which was cool we had oh, a Telemann cool. fantasy as the solo piece and then we played Ravel piano concerto and Dvorak 9 with piano uh, which was lovely and I remember the list for the final round, I was so happy because they had Shostakovich 8 as the very last excerpt. And that's my favorite, favorite, long, big English horn solo. I think between like Tristan, Swan of Twinella, and Dvor uh, or, um, Shostakovich 8, I would have chosen the Shostakovich. So I felt like I really had something to offer. Um, and, and something that felt different about this audition was that I felt much more present. Previously in auditions, I would play and kind of feel, you know, well, I think that went well, but maybe not. And then sometimes I would advance and sometimes I wouldn't. And, you know, I, I never really felt like I had a good gauge of what was happening in the moment. And this audition felt really just fun. Like it really felt like I was sharing something with the committee and, um, and, it was an enjoyable and very pleasant experience. And, and I think that, well, I hope that that translated in some way because um, it was a very distinct feeling for me. And I, I kind of, 
you know, it's not that I knew I won after I played, but I felt like, you know, whatever happens at this point, I really felt like I put forth what I um, had prepared in an honest way and I communicated what I wanted to get across. And um, yeah, it felt like more of a performance. And so I hope that that had some part in my success because that's a feeling that now uh, I try to be aware of when I'm performing as well. Just this kind of rare spot of being really in the moment and really connected with uh, with what you're doing and what you're what you're putting out. What was your reaction when they said you had won? <laughs> well, so we were all the candidates were standing in a group and and. I, I had some friends in the final round with me, and so they, you know, gave me a hug and walked away. And then it was just me and our orchestra manager. And I <laughs> remember I was so embarrassed, but I just completely broke down. I just started like, oh, I really, yeah, I, I swear, I cried, like I really cried, not like a little tear. Um, and I, I remember like turning around so that she wouldn't see me because I felt like, <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm a professional now. <laughs> I need to. <laughs> <laughs> I can't know that I'm a human. <laughs> but no, I, I really, I cried. Um, and it was a moment that I'll never forget. I remember exactly where I was standing in the green room. And and then I went back up to meet the committee. And um, it was just such a warm uh, welcome from them, even at such an early stage. I mean, I still had a trial and lots and lots of hoops to jump through. But uh, it, it, felt, it felt good. It felt really good. I love yeah. that so much. I mean... <laughs> That's the group that like, <laughs> when you're just speaking as a metaphor, like to students of like, you know, oh, should I embark on this path? And it like the New York Philharmonic is the the group that always kind of gets like inserted into the blank as the example, you know, <laughs> uh, I'd be crying too. Like, that's so boss. Like, I... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, like, then you're doing this thing this like ubiquitous, not real thing. Like logically we know like people play in the Vienna Philharmonic, but it's also like people don't do that. Like, that's like <laughs> this, this thing that happens on my TV, you know? And so then you are like walking in and sitting in the chair and this is your job. Like, can we hear about that transition from the wanting to do to the doing and what's that's been like for you? Yeah, that, that actually has been such an interesting uh, an interesting transition because I feel like when we're in school, especially for people who are really focused on getting orchestral positions, you know, it's in a way you you have no sense of what you're actually signing up for because when you're in school orchestra, you'll play one concert a month or, you know, maybe two concerts a month and it's one show and you rehearse for like three weeks beforehand um, and it's a different roster of people every time. I mean, there's there's really just nothing to prepare you for what it's actually like. Um, and yet we spend all of our time and energy devoted towards this this goal that's that's so kind of um, ambiguous to us, I guess. Yeah, it's like win a job, win a job, win a job. Yeah, and and I think for me at least, I mean, it was a lot about kind of achievement without any thought to what the life was like. Um, and it was a big shock in a really kind of pleasant way, I think, honestly. I mean, I realized that playing five shows a week is really, really exhausting. And I remember initially I thought, oh my gosh, how have like the people sitting around me been doing this for 30 years, <laughs> 30 plus years, some of them. Um, it's really taxing and it forces you to, to kind of prepare in a different way, um, reads change, a lot just the way that I kind of view read making and that some specific things um, but yeah I mean you realize that it is a job and it's an amazing amazing job because it's something that you love doing but occasionally it does you know it does feel like work I mean there have been programs where for whatever reason I or you know I'm having a tough week or the there's hard low notes or something scary that I have to look forward to and you have to do it five times in a row and like if on night three you mess something up then <laughs> you mentally have to kind of prepare yourself for nights four and five and it's you just you learn so many things so quickly um, that yeah it becomes very real very very fast and actually <laughs> Jackie you mentioned seeing the orchestra on 
TV, uh, I had no idea, admittedly, this is kind of embarrassing, I had no idea what a big deal the New Year's Eve, like, telecast mm -hmm. live from Lincoln Center thing was. Mm -hmm. And um, so here I am, you know, coming in, another week of work, and I was like, oh, it's Pops music, it should be fine, and there's, we didn't really get the music very far in advance, and they were kind of adding stuff at the last minute, it was a little bit under-rehearsed, and, and there's like so many English horn solos. <laughs> And we rehearsed some of this stuff for the first time that morning. And that was the first time that I kind of realized what um, what amount of reach this orchestra has in, in the country because I was on my way home from this concert and I had like 15 Facebook messages from people that I hadn't talked to in like 10 years. I was getting emails from, you know, oh my God, I'm your like high school math teacher and I just saw you, you know, just like, <laughs> People were coming out of the woodwork because I guess I got a lot of TV time because there was a lot of English horn in this in this program, and I just remember thinking, "Oh, thank God that I didn't know how you know how big of a thing this was. I would have been so nervous. I was just up there having a great time, and everything was fine. And I was like, this is so fun. It's all Sondheim and you know Broadway tunes. And little did I know that like every person I'd ever met in my life was watching this thing on TV." <laughs> I mean, it would have been so much worse if had I known that. <laughs> You're like, that would have just put a little extra sweat right yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I want to hear more about what you had mentioned with your preparation, how being in the job changed your preparation and how it changed your read making. I want, I want the goods. Give me the goods. All right. So <laughs> one thing that I have to just be so grateful for is... I spent a lot of time, thanks to Elaine Duvas, studying orchestra music at Juilliard. I mean, it's a massive, massive, massive part of our curriculum. Um, most of the time we'd be studying the principal oboe part, but we also had English horn lessons with Rich D'Alessio and with Scott Hostetler, and um, I felt like I had a very kind of comprehensive education. So <clears throat> that came in handy hugely uh, in my first year in the orchestra because a lot of this big sort of major works I had either played before or I knew inside and out and had had studied an oboe class um, and then you kind of have to fill in fill in the blanks and learn you know this piece here and that piece there but the thing that changed the most probably was my read making um, going from a sort of studenty, uh, ultra, 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 ultra refined kind of audition type read where, you know, the reads that I was making at the time were reads that would sound perfect in like a studio class, in like a small room. And, and that's, I don't regret that. I mean, that's kind of what I needed to do. Um, and then I remember getting on stage and thinking, oh my God, this hall... <laughs> so huge and now it's under renovation so hopefully they're gonna fix some of this stuff but I mean the distance from like my chair to the last 10 rows it's a hundred literally hundreds of feet um and so a lot had to change I needed like four times as much sound and I actually remember in my trial weeks I changed I bought a new English horn, I bought like three new vocals, I bought a new shaper tip, I was using a different kind of wire, I ev everything about my reads was changed. How did, <laughs> how did you do that? That's it, so much. It was out of pure terror and necessity. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I was really, um, it was a huge change and it was a change that I needed to make. I didn't realize that, you know, it wasn't life or death whether I made this change in the first five days of playing with the orchestra. I mean, people understand that it takes time to adjust to something, you know, uh, to adjust to a hall like David Geffen Hall. But um, yeah, I I sort of upended everything about my read making process in order to just get more sound, more flexibility, um, and and just it kind of blow everything up onto a larger scale. You um, must be just the most fabulous read maker because that is what <laughs> everyone tells you not to do. Don't change <laughs> everything at the same time. <laughs> well, I don't know if that makes me the most fabulous read maker or <laughs> the stupidest read maker, but one way or the other, 
I changed everything kind of at the same time. Um, <laughs> and I, I have some very, very good readmaking mentors and friends who who bestowed their knowledge upon me and and sort of helped me navigate this process. But um, yeah, I mean, it's something that is still changing. I mean, I I'm still messing around with these variables. I will probably never feel like I've settled on any one thing because I, you know, I think that is kind of the antithesis of, of growth in some ways, but, um, but yeah, a lot of stuff changed. What are some of your North star ideas that you really look for in a read? So I'll talk about English horn reads specifically. Um, the one thing that I think is absolutely non-negotiable for an orchestral English horn read is a big opening. I really, really think it's almost impossible to get enough sound if you don't have a really healthy opening. Um, I use wire. I was using really, really thick wire, thick and soft wire. Um, so like copper crafting wire <laughs> that you can buy on Amazon that was 26 gauge or sorry, 24 gauge. Um, and now I've moved back to 26 gauge normal wire, but all of that is to help support a really, really healthy opening. Um, the other sort of North star concepts, I pay close attention to the read tests. I need my reads to peep, uh, a C or a sharp C and crow, a C sharp or a sharp C sharp. Um, if I'm playing chamber music, maybe on English horn, that'll be like a D and a C sharp rather than a C sharp and a C. But I think it's important to have some sort of objective qualities that you keep in your reads to, uh, like you said, act as a North star, act as the sort of guiding light for when things get crazy and you're changing a bunch of variables to, um, give you a point of reference. So I mentioned before I was using thicker wire and I needed big openings. Um, part of that was having really sturdy cane. I started using a, uh, a hardness tester for the first time just to kind of streamline the process of selecting cane. Um, and also to create parameters for myself just so that I wasn't spending too much time on cane that was either too soft or occasionally too hard though I do tend to like really hard cane <laughs> so I don't think I don't think there's much cane in the world that's too hard for me <laughs> um, but my shaper tip went a little bit wider as well to help me get more sound um, and I started leaving a little bit more bark at the bottom of my reeds again just to help with projection um, yeah no I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of of what else I can say about reads that's important. Everything you've said so far makes so much sense. If you're trying to get a lot more substance, a lot more volume, a lot more projection. Yeah. One thing I will say uh, is that in, in the endeavor to get more sound, I think one of the really big dangers is the, um, the loss or potential loss of flexibility and of the possibility for uh, a lot of variety and pressure and, and this um, this kind of vocal quality that I hold very central to my musical philosophy because a lot of times getting more sound requires you to either scrape less or to, you know, create something that's maybe a little bit less uh, easily influenced by, by subtle changes of air and, and pressure and, and embouchure. Um, so for me, the hardest part of getting more sound was actually getting more sound, but still being able to sound really vocal and, and really detailed and, um, and have the same amount of control that I would have had on an audition read, for example. Um, it's something that I'm constantly aware of and I'm constantly kind of striving for the the balance between something that is really just brassy and and will carry your sound to the farthest corners of the hall but also has the possibility to be um to have subtlety and and suppleness and and something uh vocal about it i think it really has to do with a variety of pressures uh if there isn't 
the possibility to kind of ghost something or to add more corn to the sound when you need it, uh, it it won't speak in the same way. It won't convey uh, in a, in a vocal sense. I am curious about, and I'm a bassoonist, so tell me if this question doesn't make sense. But you mentioned that in your training at Juilliard, um, English horn was a part of your experience there. Um, but I'm also curious about, you know, taking English horn auditions or just being kind of open to the opportunities that were presented and then determining how to delegate your time in pursuing them of, you know, how much time does oboe get English horn? You said that the list had excerpts on both and um, also kind of what that balance looks like now. So there's sort of a funny saying amongst amongst English hornists that you you don't become an English hornist until you win an English horn job, which <laughs> which is kind of I mean it's kind of true in a way in a sense. Um, when I was in high school and I was playing in all these youth orchestras, for whatever reason I would frequently get assigned English horn parts. So by the time I graduated high school, I had played English horn on. Dvorak 9 like three times. I had played William Tell. I had played, um, what else? Shostakovich 10. I mean, I, I really had a, a lot of English horn experience. Um, and at Juilliard, I took the English horn auditions, um, which were a required part of our, our curriculum there. And I started to sort of take the English horn more seriously and I was assigned some good parts in orchestra. And actually, in my last year, I had the opportunity to play the Swan of Tuonela solo on tour with the Juilliard Orchestra when we went to Helsinki and we did a side-by-side -side concert um, or a side-by-side -side tour with the Sibelius Academy and Esapekka Salonen. Oh, cool. That was like, yeah, that was a, a highlight. And I had always loved playing the English horn and I had always been told by teachers that it would open up so many doors for me in terms of employment and um it's just, I mean, it's a good thing to be able to play the English horn well. Um, but in terms of the amount of time I delegated towards English horn, it was kind of situational in a way. You know, if I had been assigned an important English horn part, it was like, okay, time to make some reads, time to, you know, get back in shape on English horn. But I will say that it always came kind of naturally to me. Um, there were people that struggled with it more than I seem to in terms of the, the just the relationship between playing the oboe and playing the English horn. Um, so I guess maybe I was predisposed towards <laughs> playing the English horn in, in a, some way. Um, but yeah, I mean, the New York Philharmonic was my first professional English horn audition that I had ever taken. Um, but I had, again, I had played so much English horn that it was kind of just like it was another audition. I knew how to prepare for it. I knew what to do with my reads and, and I felt really comfortable on the instrument. So it wasn't too much of a, uh, a stretch to be taking a professional English horn audition. Do you find that the, um, voicing, like you said that some people have a harder time switching between the two. Do you think it's the voicing differences between oboe and English horn? Yeah, I, I also think it's it's sort of just the way you use your air, and mm. I also am I'm very tall. I don't have very large hands, but I'm tall, so I felt like I was kind of comfortable with the instrument. I remember I had friends who literally just couldn't reach like this low C sharp on the English horn. I mean, yeah. it, it's kind of a problem. It's not a problem. <laughs> I mean, I think somebody talk to the makers. They have to make extension keys. I know they really do. I, it it can be prohibitive in that way. Um, but yeah, that also sort of just reminds me of another subject that I wanted to talk about, which is the differences between playing oboe and English horn. Um, a huge part of becoming an English hornist, quote unquote, uh, was figuring out what those differences were. And I think uh, it's very easy for, or it can be easy for oboists to pick up the English horn and, and sound pretty good. But there is definitely sort of another level of... Um, of attention that needs to be paid to certain things, like you said, with voicing, uh, in terms of reads and the way you use your air. I think if you were to make an English horn read that passed the octave tests perfectly like you would want your oboe reads to, 
uh, it might feel a little bit constricted or maybe even sharp in the higher register just because you have to use a little bit more air. So another huge difference between oboe and English horn is vibrato. I think if you were to use an oboe vibrato on English horn, it might sound slightly strange. Um, but on both oboe and English horn, I think that vibrato should be used as a coloristic tool and something that should be flexible. Um, and so when whenever students ask me, well, where does your vibrato come from? Do you do a throat vibrato or do you do a chest vibrato or a stomach vibrato? I answer genuinely by saying all of the above because um, when I need a character that's more anxious or more inward, I want the vibrato to sit higher in the throat and maybe be a little bit more quivering. But if I'm playing something like Strauss, a big Heldenleben solo, you want to be taking up a lot of space. And if you were to be using only your throat to, to create that kind of cello vibrato, um, I think you'd be limited. So I, you know, for that solo, I'll move it down. And I'm constantly uh, aware of my vibrato existing in different places in my body. Uh, and it it is always to serve a coloristic goal or to, to evoke a certain character. Um, but I, I really think that vibrato and color are two things that are kind of inseparable. And so if you want a big color range, uh, you should find a way to expand your vibrato to allow you to achieve all of those colors. Mm-hmm. Thousand percent. Um, could we hear about a special memory from um, performing or just your experience as a musician that you look back upon and hold dear to you? Well, I'll talk about one special performance that was special for, I think, a different reason. Um, so in my first season, we played Dvorak 9 with Dudamel, and we had five performances. And I was so excited about this, and I was so nervous about it <laughs> as well, because, I mean, it's Dvorak 9, and I'm the new English hornist, so it kind of has to be really good. Um, and things were going well. The first few nights were good. I was I was happy with how everything turned out. The third night was fine. I mean, nothing remarkable happened. And the fourth night, I don't remember exactly what it was. I just, it felt uncomfortable. My read was in a weird place. The intonation felt a little bit unsettled. And I just, it, I knew that it wasn't what I wanted it to sound like. I wasn't in the moment in the way that I talked about earlier when I was in my audition. It just felt like all I could think of was, don't mess this up, this note sounds this way, mm -hmm. you know, you're rushing, you're dragging, this, you know, my all of these negative thoughts were flooding my mind. Um, and it was a really challenging experience for me because I, you know, I'm, I'm still an untenured member of the orchestra, so theoretically at any moment they could just decide to can me. But it's during these moments that that those anxieties become very real. And we had one more night, and the fifth night was the night that my mom was coming, actually. Um, and she lives in L.A., so it was a, a big trip for her to make. And I spent the whole day trying to figure out how I was going to get through this last performance and enjoy it and make it great and, and sort of erase what had happened the night before from my memory. Um, and I think just having my mom there and also realizing that this was an opportunity, not even an opportunity for redemption, but just for personal sort of... Um, personal growth was something that I tried to think about the day of that last performance because at the end of the day we are all human beings we're all you know we're relying on these stupid little reeds anyway not to mention but what was so um, what felt so uncomfortable to me to an audience member might not have even been noticeable um, and I, I kind of tried to pull myself pull myself back up and and the last night was by far the best of the five mm -hmm. nights and I just felt very proud of myself for being able to 
handle the mental, you know, and, and emotional challenges of, of that, um, of that task and also, you know, figure out what I needed to do with my reads. And it was just, it was a moment that I was, uh, I felt very proud of myself, not because I played something perfectly, but because I was able to, um, figure out what I needed to do to make something feel good again after it didn't feel so good the night before. I love that so much. That is so amazing. <laughs> and I think it also has to do with, you know, the the growth that I was, was and am still <laughs> um, achieving in terms of moving from, you know, being a, a young player to being a more seasoned uh, professional. Because these things happen all the time. People make mistakes, you know, and when you're playing things five nights in a row, uh, there's a lot that you have to do to kind of keep yourself in a, in a good space. And so I felt like that was an experience that showed me that I am capable of, um, of overcoming that particular challenge of the job, which was a new challenge and something that, you know, I couldn't have really been prepared for previously without, you know, being in an orchestra previously. I love that. On the flip side, are there any funny or embarrassing memories that you'd like to share with us and our listeners? Okay, well, I guess I'll share the best one. This is not okay. the most recent one. There have certainly been embarrassing moments since then, but this one will always, always stand out in my mind because I also learned a very important lesson <laughs> with this one. I was in the National Youth Orchestra in my third and fourth years of high school. And the first year that we went on tour, we were in Russia um, with Valery Gergiev and Joshua Bell, and it was just this incredible musical experience. And we were playing one uh, a concert in Moscow, and it was in the Marinsky II Theater, maybe St. Petersburg, actually. Um, but anyway, there was this huge, beautiful tapestry in the back of the stage, and all of the chairs were upholstered with... Uh, another similar tapestry. They were all one of a kind, beautiful, beautiful chairs. And we were all jet lagged. So, you know, we were taking a nap before the the concert and I overslept a little bit and I thought, oh, I'm just going to wake myself up by drinking a bottle of cold water, an entire bottle. Um, so I'm on stage and, you know, we play the first piece and whatever. And then we were playing Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto with Joshua Bell. And I was playing, thankfully, uh, assistant principal oboe and i just thought oh my gosh i really have to go to the bathroom <laughs> and i'm sitting so there so scared right now <laughs> yeah i'm sitting there and i'm just thinking oh god this is you know and it's like well intermission is after this it'll be fine but then you know i was so nervous and so anxious that this was going to like really turn into a problem that it was just making it worse and worse and worse so i thought okay maybe i'll leave after like this movement and it was the kind of situation where like it just was i mean it was a, a large large bottle of water <laughs> um and that combined with the fact that i was so nervous anyway so i'm sitting here in the middle of joshua bell's cadenza and i just it it was going to be a disaster and i won't go into too much detail but i mean the seats were one of a kind upholstered seats so i had no other options here so in the he finishes like the last few notes of his cadenza, and he goes back into the you know the orchestral tutti, and my legs made the decision for me. I just jumped up and ran off stage. I kicked over a trumpet on a stand on my way, and it made this huge clattering noise, and everyone was looking at me. And <laughs> then I couldn't figure out how to get off the stage because <laughs> it, you know it's like stage doors are meant to be hidden. So I'm pushing on the walls of the stage, literally running up and down the stage, pushing on the doors until finally one of them opens. And I like run backstage and, um, you know, I found a bathroom and everything was fine. No. But I was so embarrassed that when, you know, everyone was coming up to me afterwards, oh my God, are you okay? What happened? You know, blah, blah, blah. And I, I couldn't admit what it actually was. So I said, oh my gosh, I got food poisoning. I don't know what it was. It was something that probably something that we ate because we were eating very, um, you know, we were eating food that we weren't used to eating. And I just, I couldn't admit what it actually was. But now <laughs> I swear every single 
time I have a performance, one hour before I go on stage, no more water. Not, <laughs> not even a sip. Not even one sip. This is like my golden rule now. This will never and has never happened since, but you got to learn somehow. That was probably the most embarrassing story of my of my <laughs> younger years. That is incredible. <laughs> and I 1000% also would have been like, I just had to very daintily throw up. I don't Yeah, I, don't I was know. like <laughs> anything except for what it actually was. Just because, I mean, it's something so stupid and so avoidable, too. I had to I had to say that it was something that was, like, completely out of my control, you know. Oh, the image of young Ryan Roberts just scrambling for any door. Just any yeah. door. I was, like, just pushing on all the stage doors. And, yeah, gosh, the guy backstage must have thought that, I don't know what he must have thought. But oh, my God. <laughs> that, that is incredible. A, Thank yeah, you so much for sharing that with us. Special moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to compose ourselves, but the next question's pretty oh. serious and uh, <laughs> supposed to be, you know, really thoughtful. <sighs> what advice do you have for a young musician who aspires to have a career like yours? So I have a few pieces of advice that all kind of relate to each other. Um, the first piece of advice is take every possible opportunity that you can when you are young to just play your instrument. Uh, I'm talking like every single youth orchestra, every summer program, join every chamber music group, um, do marching band, do orchestra, do concert band, do as much as you possibly can just to get yourself playing because those are the years of your life where you will be able to make music in the most uninhibited way. Um, th these are the years when you don't know that your read is messed up or you don't know that you know everyone else is playing so sharp and you're f not actually flat but you're just in tune and you know I mean <laughs> these are the years when none of that stuff matters you don't know about appoggiaturas and resolutions and about slur to tongue to and this and that it's just music is fun in those years um, and I so remember the feeling of just having a band concert and there's no reason to be nervous because it's just fun like there's, there's nothing serious about it um and that met that mode of of music making is something that i st still am striving to return to with with my new you know newfound knowledge from being trained and all this and that but um that's a really special place to be in in your life so cherish cherish those moments and cherish those performances and have as many of them as possible uh, so that you can remember that feeling forever and hopefully be able to access it when you're a little farther along in your career. Another piece of advice I would give is to let you know that musicians at a professional level, even in the New York Philharmonic, make mistakes all the time. Not just like once every, you know, 10 years they like play a wrong note. I mean, we are just normal people um, and things go wrong, even in performances, whether or not you hear it. Um, that was a huge kind of revelation for me <laughs> to, to actually see that um, and believe it in real life. Um, and I think that that's kind of a, a freeing realization that music, even at the highest level, is not not really a pursuit of perfection, um, or at least not a pursuit of perfection in a in a technical and sort of uh, you know every note perfectly in tune, no attacks missed, everything you know completely together with the orchestra. I think it's a a pursuit of um, of perfection of expression in a way. And I, I, I honestly think that, that the goal here is for everyone to be in a place where they are making music as if they were in high school honor orchestra, where everyone is just having such a good time and everyone is so committed to their individual part and everybody is just there because they love being there and, and they're trying their best and if things, you know, go a little bit this way or a little bit that way sometimes it's not the end of the world because what's so much more important than that is is the sort of collective um 
vision of the product and the, the collective uh, energy of everything that's happening on stage. So don't, th- don't take things too seriously too early on and do as much as you can and just have the most fun because things will get serious and you will have time to learn as much as you can about reads and, and preparation and intonation and all these little nitty gritty details. But at the end of the day, those details are secondary to uh, something that young musicians already have access to, which is inspiration and passion and just a true love for, for playing music and sharing it with other people. Ryan, this was such an inspiring and bolstering and fun way to spend an hour. We cannot thank you enough for joining us on Double Read Dish. It has been my absolute pleasure. Um, I have been a fan of this podcast for a long time, so I'm still starstruck being here. I'm so (laughs) excited when I got the email. No, it's us. We're starstruck. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you again so much, both of you, for having me. We hope you enjoyed that hilarious, informative, and delightful interview with Ryan Roberts. We certainly did. And if you did too, you better follow us on social media. You better subscribe everywhere that you listen to podcasts, including YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. And uh, Galit, we've got many more delightful, delicious episodes on the future path ahead. And I want to know who's coming up next. <laughs> Your professional podcast voice is cracking me up today. That was very um, NPR. Um, yes. <laughs> Galit, correspondent in Mississippi. Who is on the next episode? Well, Jacqueline Wilson. <laughs> next, <laughs> next we have Darren Zubke, assistant professor of bassoon at the University of Memphis. Can't wait to share that one with you. Jackie, let's end this nerd parade. Oh, make reads.